Her Royal Highness, Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, Madam President, Minister Manister Liu, of the Region Committee 71, Dr. Tsoi, the outgoing President of the Region Committee 70, WHO Director General, Professor Mario Monti, Chair of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is my dearest wish that this Region Committee will fill us with the energy and conviction to quickly, collectively regain control of the pandemic, never lose it again, and that this such crisis is the last one which takes us by surprise. We at the WHO Regional Office for Europe have carefully listened to your very important messages at the Region Committee 70 last year, the World Health Assembly, the Executive Board, and the sessions of the Standing Committee of the Region Committee. Your messages were instrumental to propose now future health and health system policies and actions beyond the pandemic, incorporating the lessons. We at Euro, we listened to you, we heard you, and we acted. My talk today on the state of health in Europe will have three parts. First, we will look at the present. Where are we with the COVID-19? The second part is the future. How do we move towards better health and well-being? And the third part will be on the how. So let's start with the present. Ladies and gentlemen, today I stand here to tell you that this pandemic, like all other pandemics, will pass too. I cannot tell you when, but I can tell you how. Collectively, today, we must refocus and reassess, which means asking three questions. Number one, where are we today? Number two, did we learn enough to change the course of events? And number three, how do we now anticipate the end? First, the pandemic picture today is not so much different than the one last year. Concerning, overall in the region, we have a steady increase of cases. We have a succession of pandemic waves with a set of measures taken in a reactive mode until a period of tranquility allows for some kind of relaxation. The various indicators disaggregated by age, severity, hospitalizations and ICU admissions did not change so much. But that was until vaccination started. With the increase in vaccination coverage, we saw that the incidence of severity and mortality drastically dropped. So did the pressure on our healthcare systems. Even though, as we always expected, the transmission continues in non-vaccinated population. While the vaccine has been the game changer of the year, the emergence of more transmissible, more virulent variants of concern were the evolutionary response to our great efforts. But the equilibrium is still at our advantage because the tools to control SARS-CoV-2 or the variants remain the same, including vaccination. Second question, lessons learned. Let me point out three lessons learned from the pandemic. The first one is that the pandemic has been a huge stress test for multilateralism and international solidarity. Vaccines work, vaccines save lives and many lives, and they even have the potential to bring down transmission if everyone participates. That's why the huge vaccine inequity is nothing good. In our WHO pan-European region, 58% of the eligible population in high-income countries got a full dose and only half, 29%, in the upper middle-income countries. And in the lower middle-income countries, only 9%. If we look globally, the low-income countries, only 
we in our region, we always felt global solidarity. And that's why I invited the region director of the African and the Eastern and Midland region to address you today. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Second lesson, every pandemic fight starts with the people and by the people. The pandemic everywhere in the world is ultimately local. That's why we need to increase community empowerment and community engagement and take care of the mental health of the people. First and foremost, mental health of the youth and the healthcare workers. The healthcare workers, we will need them until end of the year and beyond. And they are really the heroes of the pandemic. In fact, COVID-19 has been the most cruel reminder that no health system survives unless they have a strong primary health care. And in the 21st century, a health system will not serve much unless it is fully digitalized. The third lesson, the pandemic has been a huge stress test for public-private partnership. Public organizations like WHO need to work with the private sector, not only to increase the production of technological innovations, ensure its equal distribution, but guarantee also its affordability for every individual in the world. Lesson learning is one thing, but the other thing, in order to implement those lessons, is WHO itself, as an organization, to look at its own institutional fitness. The worst thing WHO can do today is to be self-defensive. For me, as the region director, the diagnostics is crystal clear. WHO needs to do three things. First, more interregionalism. Second, more political participation by the member states under the international health regulations. And third, more flexible financing. The first one, every region is a pole of global influence. The reason, and let me insist please, why WHO has a unique constitutional comparative advantage is that it's federated in six interlinked regions politically very proxy to the member states. Second, there is a need for urgent revision of the international health regulation or, more ambitious, a new treaty incorporating additional provisions on consequences for non-observance by its signatories. If the member states themselves will not address this elephant in the room, no IHR, no new treaty will make the world a safer place. Third, for WHO, more flexible financing. It does not necessarily mean more member state contributions. It could be, for example, a 20 to 30 percent benchmark for flexibility on all earmarked voluntary contributions. And for our region, definitely more regional autonomy in fundraising and financing. This brings us to the third question. How do we anticipate the end? We cannot say out of the pandemic, but we can say to move towards sustainable control of transmission. And what does that mean? It means no more major disruption of the health system due to COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations and the waves of the pandemic moving into seasonality or predictability with a low level endemic transmission. All of this not at the cost of societal lockdowns. In response to your repetitive request, we strengthened the normative technical function of the office and I asked Professor Antoine Flaho, director of the Global Health Center at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, a couple of months ago to lead a top-notch technical group to come up with a two-page document which is at the website with guidance how to get out of the acute phase. 
And there are three strategic directions to get out of the mayhem. First, to equitably roll out the vaccines. We need a holistic approach to increase the uptake, the production, including more diversity in geographic production, and third, more sharing. And we should leave no opportunity untouched. And it does not matter whether it is multilateral or bilateral, and we have to do it with the private sector. And yes, decreasing vaccine skepticism is a top priority by engaging and empowering the communities based on solid data, which our teams, including the Behavioral Insights team, are working on. If ministers decide to go for mandatory vaccination, we are keen to stand with them, to express appreciation and also to point out some caveats, like, for example, to anticipate that already overstretched health systems may be even more burdened. This is the first strategic direction. Second strategic direction, to implement nuanced approaches in the pan-European region, including expanding vaccination programs for children and additional doses. We can no longer see that additional doses are so-called a luxury booster. It is an essential way to protect the most vulnerable in our society. If we consider that SARS-CoV-2 will continue to mutate, will stay with us forever like influenza, we better anticipate by adapting our vaccination programs to endemic transmission, and we desperately need information on the impact of additional doses to the vulnerable people. And I discussed this with Dr. Anthony Fauci in August during my mission to the United States, and also recently with the Minister of Health of Israel and the Ambassador of Israel in Geneva. And I would like really to thank them because we need those pioneers to give us this very important information. Finally, under the second approach, we need much more development of therapeutics. If tomorrow there is a mutant which escapes immunity, our hope to change the prognosis is a good therapeutic and second-line vaccines. Third strategic direction is to maintain proportionate pressure on the virus, even in periods of tranquility. Not surrendering on masks, not surrendering on ventilation, on cross-border mobility control, and intensified testing policies, including genomic sequencing. And let's remember, the first pressure to put on the virus is by sharing transparently data from countries between countries. Ladies and gentlemen, we know more and we can more. If we implement those three strategic directions, we will anticipate the end, but only if once and for all, the politicians, the scientists and the people pull into the same direction. All crises will end, this one too. Now let's move to the second part, the future. How do we leapfrog now towards better health and well-being collectively in our region, towards a culture of health, where every individual is empowered to take healthy lifestyle decisions, independent of age, gender, sexual orientation, or socio-economic capabilities? Again, I'm very optimistic, because we have three very important levers. We have a compass, we have a toolkit, and we have an innovation. First, the compass. The compass to leapfrog towards health and well-being is the Sustainable Development Goals. 17 goals, which are the blueprint towards a better and more sustainable future. Six years after its adoption, it is time to take stock. In November, this office will publish the next European Health Report. We know already that some SDG indicators are not on track. We are not on track to finish off AIDS by 2030. Tuberculosis in countries, 20 to 30 percent drop in case detection. We have to finish the unfinished business. That's why I appointed a special envoy to the regional director on TB, AIDS and hepatitis, Professor Michel. 
Kazakhstan. Bienvenue, Michel. Environment, climate change. We know that every year in our region, 480,000 people die due to ambient air pollution linked with chronic diseases. I am very proud that the WHO European Center of Excellence on Environment and Health in Bonn next week will launch the new WHO Global Guidelines on Air Quality. And thank you, Germany, for the fantastic support to the office. We are going to strengthen the data monitoring and analysis unit in this office, which is a direct response to your call for WHO to be more normative and scientific so that you can use solid data feeding policies and actions. The Compass, second, the toolkit, the EPW. The toolkit is a European program of work which all of you approved last year and which has proven its suitability posed by the challenges of the pandemic, particularly its four flagships, mental health, immunization 2030, we're going to discuss tomorrow, behavioral insights, and empowerment through digital health. Time and again, ladies and gentlemen, you have insisted that we revisit primary health care as the cornerstone to better health and well-being taking care both of clinical needs of the people and their social determinants of health by building bridges between primary health care, essential public health functions and social services, particularly the elderly and the most vulnerable. Primary health care deserves to be the flagship of the flagships to realize the principles of the Alma Ata and Astana Declaration reaffirmed in the operational framework in 2020. And thank you so much, Dr. Alexey Vladimirovich Soy and your government of Kazakhstan for the strong support to the Center of Excellence in Almaty, which gives us the resources to assist the countries. The key lesson we learned from primary healthcare in the last 43 years is to recognize that one size does not fit all. The art of closing the implementation gap between our huge ambitions and concrete results on the ground lays in tailoring good practices to national and local context. We need to increase the prestige of the primary healthcare workers and the trust by the people in the system. How do we increase the trust? We enhance the trust by enhancing the quality of care and patient safety. And thank you so much to the government of Greece, particularly until recently, the Minister of Health, Dr. Vasilis Kikelias, and now my new friend, the Minister of Health of Greece, Dr. Thanos Plevris, for giving us the resources to finally put back quality of care at the European agenda through the WHO Athens Office on Quality of Care. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that modern quality primary health care is happening already. I had the great privilege to participate at a fantastic high-level conference on innovative health systems mid-July, organized by the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union. And as I always do, if I go to a country, I went to the community health center in Ljubljana, great simulation center also in primary health care, and I spoke to the patients. The patients wanted to go first to the primary health care. And I asked them why? Because they are managed by friendly skilled, motivated healthcare workers, accepting and receiving the whole range of services from prevention, promotion, curative care, rehabilitation, social services, and all the necessary equipment, including digital equipment, was in place. Congratulations, Minister Dr. Janis Poklukar, for putting primary healthcare in the heart of the European agenda, and also congratulations for being a health champ yourself, by regularly showing physical exercise. If, as a region, we want to reach the health-related SDGs, there are particularly two technical areas we have to link with the primary health care. The first one is financial protection, in line with the talent charter. The WHO Barcelona office, and thank you, Spain, for the great support to the office. They have now data from 33 countries answering the question, can people still afford 
to pay for health care. We know that in our region, the percentage of households being pushed into poverty because they can no longer pay for innovative medicines for chronic disease goes from 0.2% up to 10.8% with a mean of 2.7%. The good news, it's possible to go towards 0% with sound policies. And that's exactly why we established with Norway the Oslo Medicines Initiative to work together towards a new social pact between public and private sector that we hope to sign off at the political conference in June next year in Oslo. Particular appreciation to the Minister Bent Hoye and Dr. Bjorn Inge Larsen. We did consultations with the member states, the civil society, and the private sector. The 22nd of June, I was invited to the Biopharmaceutical CEO Roundtable, which then was followed by a visit last week of the Director General of the European and International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, and we got a commitment to work towards a value-based new social statement. The second technical area to link with primary health care is on healthy lifestyles and non-communicable diseases. Exactly 10 years ago, ministers of health and leaders of 167 countries came together in Moscow to sign off on the Moscow Declaration on Healthy Lifestyle and non chronic Diseases. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it is the time to renew this commitment. That's why in December 2020, I established the NCD Advisory Council on Innovation of NCDs to quickly come up with a number of signature initiatives which would have quick, visible impact at the country level. Some of those are childhood obesity, digital marketing, hypertension and salt. We're not doing fine. This is a quick win. We can save tens and tens of thousands of lives. Greener cities, health tax on alcohol, among others. 40% of cancer in our region is preventable through vaccines and healthy lifestyle. And the other 60% we start to manage much better. That's why I launched on World Cancer Day the pan-European movement, United Action Against Cancer. And I appointed a cancer ambassador, Mr. Arne Andersen, Swedish cancer survivor and inspirational speaker with political support of many countries. I would like to express here my most sincere appreciation to Minister Mikhail Albertovich Morasko of the Russian Federation and the government for the very strong support through the WHO European Center of Excellence on NCDs, which benefits the region and the world. Spasiba van Bolshoi, Michal Albertovic. So we have the compass, we have the toolkit, and we have the innovation. The innovation of the year, I would call the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development to rethink policy priorities in the light of pandemics. What was the idea? The whole idea was for WHO to go beyond the traditional remit of speaking to the converted public health community and to target heads of state, minister of finance, to convince them of upfront investment into health and one health as a global public good. We could only do this with a real robust caliber as a chair. And I'm very indebted. I would like to salute the chair of the Pan-European Commission, Professor Mario Monti, former Prime Minister and Minister of Finance and European Commissioner, Italian Senator for Life and President of Bocconi University, for his outstanding political, academic and diplomatic skills, which combined with his individual impressive investment led to a successful outcome in time of a unique Commission. Grazie mille, dear Mario. With the help of Professor Monti, dear Mario, already the preliminary recommendations were presented to 20 heads of state, to the President of the European Commission, to the President of the European Union, to the G20 Presidency. And thank you so much, dear Mario, for inviting me with discussion with Prime Minister Draghi at one of those very inspiring 
They were presented at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum and I had the opportunity during my last mission, my first mission to the United States, to also present it to the National Security Council in the White House in Washington, D.C. I would like to thank here also Professor Martin McKee of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board. This report is underpinned by very solid evidence that Professor McKee took the lead on with the Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you to Professor Elias Mosialos, the scientific coordinator, and Professor Alexander Torbica from Serbia for being such a chief advisor to Professor Monti. Ladies and gentlemen, now I will come to the third part. We spoke about the present, the COVID-19, how to get out of it, about the future, the health and well-being. The third part is about WHO, fit for purpose, the how. How are we going to assist you? Because I promised that during the pandemic, we would also learn the lessons to sharpen our intervention methods. The pandemic has led in particularly deepening three dimensions of our work that will amplify in the future. The first one is direct country contact. Every single day in the pandemic, we kept direct country contact with you. A prime example, I would say, is what I call COVAX Plus. COVAX has delivered 13 million doses out of 26 million and was very important and remains very important, but particularly at the start. As of today, we have 20 million doses through bilateral donations. So I appointed a special envoy on COVID-19 vaccination rollout, Dr. Clemens Ower, so that this office can be a matchmaking forum. We have a detailed list of the countries with the surplus, the vaccines, the expiry dates, matching with the needs in the other countries. And I would really like to thank the main countries, bodies supporting those bilateral donations. The European Union, the Russian Federation, the United States of America, the People's Republic of China, Romania, Germany, and many more. Particularly thanks to Commissioner Oliver Varheli from DG Near, with whom we are in constant touch, and also Ms. Sandra Galina from DG Santé and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, Mr. Alexander Schallenberg, for his coordinating role. This is a prime example of united action for better health. Every single day during the summer, I knocked on one of your doors, of your presidents, of your prime ministers. I am so proud as a regional director. Whenever I knocked on your door and of your presidents, not one time the door remained closed. This direct contact with the countries was facilitated by our country offices and the many field visits. I feel very proud. I have the best staff in the world. I want really to pay tribute to the staff in the country offices, the GDOs, Copenhagen, and their families, including mine, who were very worried because never one day we have stopped going to the countries during the pandemic to red zones when you requested us, even when we were for months not vaccinated ourselves. We could, but we decided the principle of equity. We did not want to jump the queue and favor ourselves. Thank you very much to all the colleagues of WHO. This direct country contact we supplemented but why, by what I call a new brand of WHO Europe. Sub-regional approach. A good example is the development of the West Balkan Roadmap on Health and Wellbeing 2021-2025, which will be the political, financial and technical instrument to close the health gaps in the Western Balkan with the surrounding countries. And thank you so much to the Prime Minister of Slovenia, Dr. Janis Jansa, who immediately supported its launch. The other sub-regional initiative, which we are very committed to, is the Small Countries Initiative. And thank you so much to the Captain Sergeant for addressing our region committee. And thank you, Minister of Health and Solidarity of San Marino, Mr. Roberto Cevata, for recommitting to be the Dean. And congratulations also for your fantastic leadership as Vice President of the World Health Assembly this year. We are very proud. In order to increase the mutual understanding and knowledge 
between our member states and WHO Europe, I am so proud that despite of the pandemic, I can announce the first pilot project this month, this very month, of the WHO European Leadership Academy. One of my campaign commitments. Remember, I still look to my small booklet to tick off all my commitments. We got 117 applicants in the first pilot project from Western Balkan, Central Asia and the Russian Federation. Through an independent process, we came up with 11 young professionals, prospective professionals, because the idea is to build a cadre of young public health professionals, particularly from those countries which are underrepresented in the United Nations. They will come for one year to WHO, get formal and informal training, be seconded to country office and GDOs, and then go back to the country. I had a great discussion on that one with the new director of the WHO Global Academy in Lyon, who I invited before the end of the year, and we agreed that the WHO European Leadership Academy will be the pioneer of the Global WHO Academy. Direct country contact, sub region approach. Second modus operandi that will amplify partnership. I believe in the power of positive partnership. The problem is too huge, the resources are too limited. For me, partnership is a ethical duty. The IPPR, the IHR Review Committee, the IEOC, all the reports of the World Health Assembly went into that direction, encouraging collectively the development of a global governance around a strong WHO in partnership. Let me point out some of those. First, the Central European Initiative. I am very obliged to the Prime Minister of Montenegro, Excellency Zdravko Krivokabic, and the Secretary General of the CEI, Ambassador Roberto Antonioni. Thank you so much, Excellencies, for always giving this office a prime spot on the meetings of the heads of government, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Health, to unify actions and solidarity across 17 EU and non-EU countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you so much to the Minister of Health of Turkey, Dr. Fahrettin Koja, and the Secretary General of the Turkic Council, Ambassador Baghdad Amriyev, for close collaboration, not at least through our GDO, our Center of Excellence in Istanbul, an incredibly important center. We worked with the center, the Turkic Council, but also all countries on advanced trauma care, simulation of pandemic, including politicians, and mass casualty, mass casualty management. Teşekkür Yedrim, Minister Koja. I want to thank Madame Valentina Ivanovna Madvenko, who we saw speaking this morning as the chairwoman of the Interparliamentary Assembly of the CIS countries. It is so important to work with the speakers of parliament if we want sound policies to combat the NCDs. And I'm very much looking forward to interact with all the speakers of parliament of the CIS in St. Petersburg, end of November. Spasiba van Bolshoi. I would like to thank the minister, Viktor Vladimirovich Nazarenko, minister in charge of technical regulation of the Eurasian Economic Commission, with who, together with the WHO representative of Russia, Dr. Vujinovic, we celebrated in St. Petersburg, at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, the first ever in history sub-regional pharmacopoeia in the Russian language. Pazdravlayu, Viktor Vladimirovich. And finally, thank you to Dr. Dmitry Leonovich Pinevich, with whom we will sign a new memorandum of understanding between the CIS Council for Cooperation on Healthcare and the WHO Regional Office for Europe mid-October in Minsk. And I hope to see all the Ministers of Health there of the CIS. And of course, we continue to strengthen the traditional partnerships with UNICEF. Recently, with my wonderful colleague Afshan, we had a press conference on safe schooling and COVID-19. With UNDCO, the director will speak later today. Thank you so much, Gui. Because the collaboration with the 17 UNRCs within the UN reform is so important and we're very close now. Same for the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Ms. Brigitte, Bishop Ebison, was here last week. We signed the MOU. Without civil society, we will leave people behind. Thank you so much. Mangitak. And 
also other agencies like UNFPA, which I became and our office much more closely with the region director, Alana Armitage, on prevention of violence in women, on the UN decade of healthy aging, on sexual reproductive health and rights. Finally, let me point out one WHO internal partnership, which I think will be crucial for global reform of WHO. It is the partnership between regions. We have a great group of six region directors. Every region is a pole of global influence and global multilateralism because it's the regional offices who are politically, culturally, linguistically close to the countries. If there's an alert to do, including for a pandemic, we are on top. Every regional director is exerting on a daily basis multilateralism. That's why the strengthening of the WHO regional offices was put by the co-chairs of the IPPR, Ms. Helen Clark, when she spoke to Professor Monti, and many ministers told me personally that the one thing they learned from the pandemic, how important is the role of the WHO Region Office for Europe? Not to negate the role of headquarters, on the contrary, to complement it, to strengthen it. And if temporary need, of course, we will take the lead, like, for example, the last one year and a half for universal health coverage. I would like to thank Dr. Ahmed Almandari, the RD from EMRO, with who I am almost daily contact to anticipate together the health needs of the people of Afghanistan. You're working with Dr. Mawiti Chihiri, who also will address you. I invited them. And Dr. Ahmed on a new narrative of the health of refugees and migrants that we will put forward at the first half of next year in Istanbul at the high-level three-regional political conference. Looking cross-regional, to the big challenges like climate change. I want to thank really Dr. Poonam Singh. Poonam was my RD when I was working in Myanmar and we did together a fantastic policy dialogue on sustainable health workforce. Thank you so much to Dr. Carissa Etienne, who was my ADG on health systems and I continue to learn from her. She was a wonderful host together with HHS during my high level mission to the United States of America and we agreed on the tripartite between PAHO, Euro, US, Department of Health and Human Services on the very crucial issue of vaccine disinformation, which most likely Dr. Fauci also will speak about today. And finally, thank you so much to Dr. Takeshi Kasai for immediately supporting the invitation I got from the Minister of Health of the People's Republic of China, Minister Ma, to go to Beijing to start up a tripartite collaboration, People's Republic of China, WebPro, and Euro on the digital health flagship. Finally, the third modus operandi, WHO fit for purpose. I would like to pay tribute to my standing committee of the region committee. This has been a very uncertain time for WHO, for myself as a new region director. Whenever I called 24-7 to ambassador Kronig Romero, to the SRC members, they were there to guide, always leaving me the trust and the initiative. But it was very important for me always to get the backing that we were going into the right direction in these uncharted territories. The transformation in the WHO for Office for Europe has now finished. We finished this last year when we aligned organizational structure, resource allocation and programming to align with EPW and GPW 13. I had promised you no endless transformations. The transformation in Euro is now transforming itself into what the Japanese industry calls Kaizen. Kaizen means continuous improvement involving all employees. And over Kaizen, will center around country focus to deliver on your needs and expectations around a culture of innovation and collaboration based on values, around digitalization and a leaner administration, and for a healthy and respectful 
workplace with zero tolerance to harassment, including sexual harassment. In the 21st century, there is no place for any organization with a culture of fear where people are afraid to speak up. Franklin D. Roosevelt was telling, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. With the Ombudsperson, the Committee on Health and Wellbeing, and the Executive Council, we're putting in place now a program of psychological safety in the workplace throughout the region, so every staff member, every consultant, every intern, every volunteer will be able to thrive, to learn and to innovate to serve you better. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude with the three overarching directions that the office will take forward in the next biennium. First one, together we need political leadership and coordination to finish off this crisis. Second, strengthen primary health care for resilient health systems. And third, more inter-regional collaboration to make WHO globally stronger. The deaths and the suffering by the pandemic will be imprinted in universal memory for a long time to come. But it also enables society to see the paramount importance of health and its interlinkages with other sectors, particularly with economy and education. And let's not forget, it created a bond between all inhabitants in the world. Whether solidarity will come from the heart or from the brain, it is an essential dimension of future societies. Leaving no country behind, leaving no individual behind, is not a slogan. It is our collective duty. Thank you.